All right, welcome to another video for AP Statistics, and this video is for testing a claim about a proportion. We're going to do a full example, all work shown, all details explained in this video to really help sure you understand. And notice I'm using, uh, experiment with some cool new fonts here, right, to see if I can make this any prettier. All right, so here's the problem that we're going to tackle today. All right, steel ingots are large chunks of steel that are molded into solid pieces to be shipped to companies that require steel for production of products. So imagine a, just a big chunk of steel, right? Like a, like a nice, solid, three-dimensional, rectangle, square, whatever, it could be a square, rectangle, chunk of steel. All right, well, the process of making steel ingots, inevitably, some end up getting cracked, which means that they have to be remade, which is a costly expense to the company. Now, traditionally, it is known that 10% of ingots get cracked during the molding process. Well, a newly hired engineer believes that he has developed a better process for making ingots that allows for less of a proportion to be cracked. So to test this claim, the company owners, the company owners sample a random 165 ingots made with the new process and find that only 10 of them are cracked. Does this provide significant evidence that less than 10% of ingots are cracked under the new molding process? Now, let's just, before we do too much here, let's start with the basics. The true proportion traditionally of cracked ingots is 10%. Our sample that we're hoping to show less was 10 cracked out of 165. That is a proportion of 0 0.0606. Now, Technically, that is lower than 10%, but the question is, is it significantly lower, so much lower, that this new process invented by this new engineer really does work to lower the percent of cracked ingots? Or are we just seeing some natural variation that occurs when you look at a sample? Meaning that, yes, this sample came back a little bit lower, but it doesn't really mean that the process is truly working for all ingots. All right, let's go ahead and start with our very specific four steps. The first step is the hypotheses. You must have both a null hypothesis and an alternative hypothesis, which we abbreviate with these symbols. Now, the null is, you know, status quo. Nothing is more, nothing is less, everything's the way it should be. So we're going to assume that the true proportion of cracked ingots is still and will always be, for the current time period at least, 10%. The alternative is that <clears throat> excuse me, is, is, you know, based on the question, right? Is it greater than? Is it less than? Is it not equal to? you got to read the question to figure that out. Well, I'm pretty sure the question made it very clear that we were hoping that this new process makes there be less than 10% of cracked ingots. So those are your null and your alternative hypotheses. Pretty easy, pretty straightforward. Don't forget both of them. All right, next up, we got to check those conditions. I'm just going to verbally check these conditions real quick. You're the ones that need to write this out real nice. Because if we're going to build a sampling distribution, all these conditions need to be checked. The sample of 165 ingots must be random to avoid bias. 165 ingots must be under 10% of all ingots that this company makes in order for independence to be sued. And I do need 10 or more successes and 10 or more failures. So again, I'm going to go with the idea that we have 165 ingots. If 10% of them traditionally are cracked, well, that is 16.5 ingots that are cracked. That is more than 10. And then of the 165 ingots, 90% of them are going to be, I guess we would call these failures, but realistically, these are uncracked ingots. And this number is 148.5. So again, both of these numbers are greater than or equal to um, 10 so that the normal model can be used. All right. So again, please make sure you write those conditions out. Really nice full sentences. All right. Whoop. Went too low. <coughs> step three is my favorite step. Doing all the work, right? Now, if you recall, there are three steps inside of step three. Kind of easy to remember. Step three has three steps, right? All right, so the first thing we have to do is we've got to create a sampling distribution under the assumption that 10% is true. So a sampling distribution, we're talking about the mean of all samples. We're going to look only at our sample, but we've got to consider what all of them look like. So the mean of all those P hats would be 10%. Why would it not be, right? That's true. But again, we know that samples do one thing really, really, really well, is that they vary. So the standard deviation of the sampling distribution is going to be the square root of 0.10 
times 0 0.90 divided by my sample size of 165. In here, um, I get 0 0.0234. And I always tell kids, if you don't believe me, check on your own calculator. So I got the center. I got the spread. Now I just need a picture of the shape. And again, because that third condition passed, the shape is going to be normal. Right smack dab in the middle is going to go 10%. And I'm going to go up one, up two, up three, down one, down two, down three. So I'm going to take my 10%. I'm going to go up 0 0.0234. And what I usually tell kids is, for the sake of the picture, I will allow you to round this to two decimal places. Now, it's not going to be a very accurate picture, but um, it is, you know, a little bit easier to draw this, all right? And, you know, I don't know how other teachers feel about this, but I'm okay with it only for the sake of the picture. All right. Now, this picture is important because it allows me to get a picture of all P hats that are out there. And I see that any sample way up here would be significantly high. That'd be really weird if I had that many cracked ingots or that high of a proportion of cracked ingots. And anything way down here is also very, very significant. So now it comes time for us to locate our sample. If you remember, our sample was 10 out of 165 cracked ingots. That was 0 .06, .06. Now I see that that is right around here somewhere. But again, only the z-score could pinpoint that exactly for me. So I'm going to take 0 .0606 .06 minus the center, 0 .10, divided by the standard deviation. And this will tell me exactly how many standard deviations below the mean my sample is. And I get negative 1.68. I want to get a couple more decimals uh, for that. And um, I thought I had them written down. But I'm going to go to my calculator real quick here and get those numbers. One, negative 1.6838. All right, so now it's time to find my p-value. Um, and again, real quick, sorry. My mark is, again, pretty close, right? It's, again, because I was doing some rounding, it's not exact, but somewhere right around here, negative 1.6838. Now, to be honest, just by the eye test, that doesn't really seem to be that low of a sample. It's lower, <coughs> but I mean, honestly, it's really not that low. And that should kind of already tell you something about your conclusion. All right, next I want to find the p-value. Oh my goodness, please make sure you know the definition of a p-value. The p-value is the probability of your sample occurring or more extreme. Now in my case, or more extreme would be even lower because I'm already lower than what is expected, 10%. So or more extreme would be even lower. So it'd be even lower than my 0 .0606. .06. Now that is equivalent to finding the probability that a z-score is less than negative 1.6838 because again, forgot an 8 in there, 1.6838, because that z-score is calculated from my p-hat. So now the big question is, how do I get this number? This is where you're going to go on your calculator to normal CDF. And remember, normal CDF only speaks in the language of z-scores. You're going to start at negative 99 because we want to look lower. So we want to go left to right. So we're going to start way, way, way down here at negative 99. And we're going to stop an upper value of negative 1.68. 38, and that is, of course, our z-score. And that gives us a p-value of 0 0.0461. Now, it's very clear because sometimes on quizzes, tests, homework assignments, who knows, the AP tests even, you might be asked, what is a p-value? Please keep in mind, this is a very specific probability. It is the probability of our sample occurring or more extreme given that 10% is true. So remember, we built this entire model on the assumption that 10% was the true proportion. So assuming 10% is true, this right here is the probability of my sample occurring or more extreme. Now we have to make a conclusion. When you make a conclusion, what you do is you compare your p-value to your level of significance. <coughs> Typical levels of significance. All right, this is our alpha level. Typical levels of significance are 
typically, this is me personally, to be honest, I like to say anything under 1% chance of occurring is very significant. But some people do go with 0.05, which is 5% significant, which means anything under 5% is what is significant. And our p-value, if you recall, was 0.0461. And this is a really important p-value because based on what alpha you choose, you can actually have two different conclusions. So I'm actually going to go through both conclusions with each different alpha so you can understand this. So if I use an alpha of 0.01, I would say this. Since 0.0461 is, is uh, whoa, 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 sorry, wrong symbol there, <laughs> is greater than 0.01, I will fail to reject the null. Now, what does that mean, I will fail to reject the null? This means more, you know, more um, logically thinking. This means there, there, huh, there is no evidence, because this was not significant, there is no evidence that cracked ingots occur less than 10%. So if I fail to reject the null, that means I'm not saying the null is true. I'm not saying that 10% of ingots are still cracked. What I'm saying is that there's no evidence that it, it's less than 10%. So I, I fail to reject the null. There is no statistical significant hard evidence that says that this new molding process has definitely reduced the proportion of cracked ingots. No doubt 0 0.0606 is lower than 0 0.10, but it's not significantly low enough for me to say that there is definitely less cracked ingots than before. All right, now I'm also going to write up the other answer because if you would use an alpha level 0 0.05, you would say this. Since 0 0.0461 is less than 0 0.05, in this case, I will reject the null. What does rejecting the null mean? This means there is evidence because something significant did occur. Again, if you're going to say your level of significance is 0.05, that means that what you saw was significant. Now, not by much, but it was significant. So I will reject the null. There is evidence that the proportion of cracked ingots is less than 10%. Okay? Now, you don't have to give both of these answers. My goodness, no. You only got to give one answer, but it is based on your alpha. This is why we love really low alpha values. When you're, when I'm sorry, really low p-values. When your p-value is like point oh 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 oh, that is very convincing evidence. No matter what your alpha level is, that's very convincing evidence that you should reject the null and there is evidence to go with the alternative. And you know, p-values that we hate are p-values like this because it all depends on what alpha level you choose that will can totally change your decision. Now, I will say this, a lot of AP questions will tell you ahead of time what alpha level to use, that way you can't end up with two different answers based on your alpha level. But in this example, I didn't tell you what alpha level to choose. Most people do go with one of these two values, and again, in a situation like this, which hopefully won't happen too often, but in a situation like this, you can have two different answers. And again, if you actually go back to our picture, this actually makes sense because, boy, we are tight roping that line, right? Typically, we say anything below two is, is starting to become unlikely. Well, we are right close to that. I mean, our Z-score was pretty close. We were right around that 6% mark. And this is, you know, where it's like, eh, are we significant? Or are we not? And if you're going to go with um, an alpha level of 0.01, well, then you're saying, listen, to be completely honest, significant has to be way down here. And in that case, we are not significant. So that's why we're saying, hey, I'm going to fail to reject the null. I cannot officially say that there are less cracked ingots. But if we want to be a little bit more lax, maybe, maybe we go with an alpha level of 0.05. And then now we're going to say, okay, anything lower than this is significant. And that's where in our case, we would say, oh, wow, this is significant. So it's really important to understand that idea. 
because again, that's what leads you to potentially different conclusions. But again, hopefully, you know, you have really low p-values or really high p-values. That way you don't have this problem occurring. But this is the problem. Hopefully you guys understood it all. And the big thing is wording, right? Like I know I was kind of brief with my answers here, but make sure you word it really nice in context. No evidence that cracked ingots occur less than 10% of the time, or, or there is evidence the proportion of cracked ingots is less than 10%. Really, you know, use that context to give a nice final answer. All right, guys, see you in the next video.